Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, please. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Verse 24, Jesus speaking, or Jesus uh, is about to speak. It says, then Jesus said to His disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In the passage that uh, I've just read, Jesus is speaking directly to His disciples who are beginning to wonder if the cost of being a disciple might be a little steep. And so He kind of reviews with them you know, that it's not easy being a disciple. To this doubt and wavering, He responds by uh, telling them three things about discipleship. Very briefly, one, discipleship requires self-denial. The verb requires. It requires self. There is no discipleship without self-denial. You know, it's about wanting and working towards what God wants for you, not what you want for yourself. And these two will be in conflict for the entire time of your discipleship. It's always what God wants from you or for you, and on the other side, what you want for you, and these things are, you know, they're in battle all the time. So that's the first thing he tells disciples and certainly would be disciples. Secondly, he says discipleship is a, it's an all or nothing proposition. You're all in or you're all out. You know, there's no halfway measures. You can't be a part-time or a half-committed disciple of Jesus Christ. You either go all the way or no way. I mean, you can fool yourself, you can do that, you can fool yourself thinking you, know, you can have your toe in the water and think, yeah, I'm a disciple, but that's not the way, that's not the way it works. And the third thing he says is that nothing else can give you what discipleship gives you, which is salvation. Now there may be a lot of things that look nicer, feel better, seem easier, more accessible in this life, but you cannot trade all of these things for eternal life. As a matter of fact, there are many ways that a person can lose their salvation once they have obtained it. I'm not going to dwell on that idea. I think with this group here, we're pretty familiar with that idea in Galatians chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. You know, Paul is saying, you know, you can, you're fallen from grace. You could, you know, if you've gone back to the law, if you've gone back to trying to save yourself through works of the law, you're fallen away from grace. Well, that's another way of saying you, you're lost again. And of course the Hebrew writer puts more meat on the bones in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 26 to 32 when he talks about the individual who once has tasted life and the, the spiritual things of Christianity and then you know, falls away, you know, cannot be renewed. So the Bible is fairly clear about the fact that you can be saved but you can forfeit that salvation, you can throw it away, you can, you can lose it. So God has warned His people to be careful with this precious gift and not forfeit it for any person or any, anything. For this reason, I'd like to run through with you as a way of caution, the top 10 ways that a disciple can lose his or her soul. That's the name of the sermon, you know, top 10 ways you can lose your, your soul. And as we go through these top 10, you'll soon notice that this is not a new list. It's not a list that I've kind of just made up here, but a very old list found in Exodus chapter 20, and I would ask you to turn over to Exodus chapter 20, because we'll be reading out of that particular passage. And I will review the top 10 ways to lose your soul, and I'll do them in reverse order, you know, from 10 down to one, like they do modern top 10 lists. So here we go, top 10 ways to lose your soul. Number 10, greed. Greed, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You know, one of the hungriest soul eaters is greed. The feeling that we, we never have enough, 
There's never enough, and it's not always material things. I'm not happy enough, I don't have enough of this. I'm not, I'm not uh, appreciated enough. You, you, you get the drift of what I'm saying here? It's not just greed for stuff, it's greed also for emotion as well. We use all kinds of tactics to hide our greed. We pretend we want to be the best we can be when what we really want is to be better than everybody else so that we can have more stuff than everybody else. It's a fallacy to think that only the rich are greedy. Greedy is a state of mind equally possessed by rich and poor. Greed kills the soul because it fixes the attention on getting rather than on giving. And when we're focused on getting, regardless of the reasons that we tell ourselves, then our eyes are off of heaven and riveted on the things of this world things that we can get. So number 10 ways to lose your soul, greed. Number nine, dishonesty. Dishonesty, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You know, what a wonderful world this would be if everybody told the truth. Oh, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be great? Our leaders in politics would say something and we would say, wonderful, great. Yes, we can take that to the, to the bank. Nobody would lie, right? Nobody would fudge. How many souls are lost each day because lying is easier than telling the truth? Because lies you know, cover our mistakes and they cover our weaknesses. Lies many times makes you richer quicker. Lies save you from justice, sometimes justice that you deserve but we lie to get out of it. Dishonesty is the servant of pride. Whenever there is a first lie, it's usually told to protect ego or to lift one's ego above another. Then the other lies simply come about to protect the original deception. Lies destroy souls because they ruin character and they ruin relationships and they diminish whatever value one person has. I mean, look at the, a very respected newscaster in our nation, uh, I mean, who has been doing this for years and years and years, has the you know, universal respect from politicians and from individuals who watch the nightly news on national television and he tells one, and not a huge lie like, you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? Just, he kind of inflated a story. And look how quick his fall from grace was. An entire career uh, built up over 20 years, gone in, in a day, in 24 hours. Why? Because he was caught in a, uh, in a, in, in a lie. Terrible, terrible things. You know, God is true and His word is truth. And to lie is to become a son of the devil, who is the original liar, as the Bible says, the father of lies, John chapter 8, 44. So number nine, soul killer, lying. Number eight, soul killer, theft. Exodus 20, 15, you shall not steal. You know, a close cousin to lying is stealing. There's an old saying that goes, if they lie, they'll steal, right? If it's easy to lie, it's just another step to steal, to take something that isn't yours. One vice seems to follow the other. In our materialistic, highly competitive world, there is much temptation and pressure to get what you need in order to keep up with everybody else, even if you have to cheat and steal in order to get it. You know, steal a car, steal an idea, steal somebody's work, cheat to get an edge. It's all the same thing. Whenever you take what doesn't belong to you, no matter how little it is, it's stealing. Now the sad part is that a person may save time or money or effort by stealing, but they forfeit their soul in doing it. And so theft, stealing, soul killer number eight. Number seven, number seven that destroys our soul, impurity. Impurity, Exodus 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. Amazing how compact the Bible is. You shall not commit adultery. 
The misuse of sex is the most powerful tool that Satan has in destroying us. You know, the natural power of sex makes it a potentially dangerous thing. Um, uh, a little bit like explosives. You know, it can be used for good or for bad. In its proper state within marriage, sex has the power to bond two people together into family for life. Imagine you take two sinners and you bring them together and through not only sex, but certainly through the power of sex, you bond them as one flesh and create a new entity called the family. So God created this as a, a mighty and powerful uh, device uh, for use within the, within the family. But when used outside of this format, the very same type of, quote, physical activity, but used outside of marriage, what happens? Things like adultery and homosexuality, pornography, all other types of perverse sexual activity and impurity, illicit sex, what does it create? Guilt and self-hatred and shame and the feeling of unworthiness. Take it from somebody who's been doing counseling in a church setting for over 35 years and, and I'll tell you, people who have been guilty of sexual sin, they feel it down deep in their bones. It's not like, well, when I was a kid I stole a car, feel bad about that, you know, I went to jail and my dad had to pay a fine and da da da. And they can kind of you know, get over it but that I cheated on my wife, or that I began to consume pornography and then pretty soon pornography began to consume me. After a while, even though one confesses that sin, even though one acknowledges that sin before God and so on and so forth, even though one begins to make amends in some way or to straighten out their life, that sexual impurity, it just scars so, so deep. People feel guilty about it for years and years, even after they've been forgiven. Some people, you know, they can't even ask for forgiveness. And those who do struggle their entire lives with feelings of unworthiness and uncleanness. It's no wonder that Paul warned against sexual type sins as a sin against one's own body in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. So the, the number seven, soul killer, illicit or improper uh, sexual activity. So simple, it's just so simple to understand. It's a wonder sometimes why people fall away because of this particular sin. I guess it's easy to understand, not so easy to do, not so easy to resist, especially in our society, right? Where we are living in a sex-saturated society. I mean, it's just everywhere. You can't get away from it. It's in movies, it's in commercials, it's on TV, it's in books, it's in the newspaper. You, know, you read the newspaper, you see, you see pictures in the newspaper that are like common stories or advertising about you know, Sports Illustrated, the swimsuit edition, you know, which would have been considered pornography you know, 40, 50 years ago. So we're, we're surrounded by it. Uh, it's always there to, to attack it. Uh, and it's a dangerous thing. It, it, it kills the soul. Uh, number six, soul killer. Uh, murder, for sure. Murder. In Exodus uh, chapter 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Murdering someone is definitely a soul destroyer because it's a direct strike at God, since man is made in the image of God. Of course, few people actually deliver the final blow that ends the life of another human being. In other words, you know, I know they make tons and tons of movies about cold-blooded killers, but they're probably less cold-blooded killers than actual movies that they're made about cold-blooded killers. Still a terrible sin. On the other hand, many of us are guilty of inflicting the kind of damage that leads in that direction. You know, the secret harm of gossip or the silent harm of resentment and indifference. Some people punish you with their indifference. They wouldn't touch you, they wouldn't strike you, they wouldn't say a word to you, but their indifference towards you is their aggression the debilitating harm of abuse to another or oneself through mental torment or substance abuse, 
uh, violence against the weak, violence against the unborn, terrible violence against the unborn. God puts a high premium on human life because it shares His own nature, and when we damage or endanger our lives or the lives of others, our own soul is at risk. And today, again, we live in a society where people think of nothing, it's nothing to risk their lives in order to experience an adrenaline rush. Imagine to take this gift of life that God has given you and to jump off a you know, 70 story building you know, and risk that life for, for what? For, for 15 minutes of fame? To, 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 to be able to put a patch of some soft drink company on your, on your jacket to, to, to make some money? You're going to take this life that God has given you and, and risk it unnecessarily for fun? What a society that we, that we live in. You know, the ancient law of life still stands today as it was written in, God, in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. You know the old story about capital punishment, not going to get into that, that's a whole lesson's worth. You know, but capital punishment is not, is not designed by God in order to uh, stop another killing. It's a question of justice. It's a question of justice. God's divine justice for the taking of a life. Number five, soul killers. Dishonoring parents, chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Isn't it interesting that study after modern day study concludes that the majority of our social ills can be traced back to the breakdown of the family unit. But what does that mean, the breakdown of the family unit? Well, it means that fathers and mothers refuse to take on their parental responsibilities and children rebel against their parents, either one of these. Mom doesn't do what mom has been given to do or dad refuses to do what he is supposed to do. And children also rebel against the thing that God demands of them to do in regards to their parents. Any one of those elements out of whack creates problems. The result of this manifests itself in a sinful and chaotic social situation and further destruction of modern families who are caught in this vicious cycle. When I was preaching in Montreal, in our congregation there, it was in a very poor part of the city, and uh, uh, what was really fascinating was the, 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 the socioeconomic, you know, uh, a makeup of our congregation. We had people in that congregation who were like in third generation people collecting welfare. Third generation. The grandfather began collecting welfare, had children. His children grew up and they got married or they started having children and they were on welfare. And then the children, as they became adults, didn't find jobs and they, you, had, you had welfare checks being delivered into homes where three generations were collecting welfare. You know, talk about the, the breakdown of the, of the family. And that's just one example I give from a personal example, but it, so, many, so many others in our society today. If you, if you look at the people you know, who they put on the newspapers, this guy was caught for doing this and this girl was doing that, and then, you know, they go to jail. When you interview them and you ask them, tell me about your home life. Tell me about your home life. Invariably, the home life is, well, I was raised by a single mom. My dad wasn't there, or my mom wasn't there. Or my mom and dad were there, but they were addicts. Or there was, there was no work. Or I didn't work. Or I quit school. Or, well, uh, you know, um, I had my first child when I was 15. You know, I mean, the stories are always the same. And it's unfortunate that so many people today, so many social leaders, refuse to accept the idea, the very basic idea, that the fabric of our society is being torn apart at the same rate that the family is being torn apart. That so many people, so many leaders, so many politicians do not want to put, kind of put these two ideas together, and yet they go together. The Bible says that honoring parents is the surest way 
to be blessed by God because it preserves the family and it helps avoid the corroding influences of the world that kills a person's, that kills a person's soul. I'm not saying that a broken family is a justifiable excuse for a broken life, but it certainly is something that contributes to a broken life. I was raised by a single, uh, by a single mother, uh, so it's not an automatic deal that if, if, if you're raised by a single parent, you're, you're not going to make it, but it sure makes it difficult. I remember in our lives, in our home lives, not being able to go to college, not being able to do things, having to work, having to be alone, you know, when you're eight years old and you, and you go to school by yourself when you're eight years old, and you have your house key tied around your neck and you come home and there's nobody there and you open the door and you unlock it and the TV's your babysitter and you make your own supper till your mom gets home. You can do that for a couple of days. Try doing that for a couple of years. Try being raised in a house where there is no father, where there is no leader. Try being raised in a house where no one says, let's go to church. Let's go to Bible camp. Let's study the Bible together. Try, try being raised in a home like that. See how successful you can be in this society. Because if the parents won't raise you, you know who's going to raise you? Yeah, TV's going to raise you. Hollywood is going to raise you. The government's going to raise you and look at the wonderful job that they've done in the last 40 years. Number four, I don't want to read the title, but the number four soul killer is dishonoring God. And I say that because the last four ways actually are one and the same. They constitute the number one way to lose one's soul, and that is dishonoring God. Each one of the last four can cause a person or a disciple to lose their souls, but in different ways. For example, we can dishonor God by ignoring spiritual exercises. Let's read chapter 20, beginning in verse eight. It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your father, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. A person's soul needs to be fed in the same way that his physical body needs to be fed, needs to be cared for. Souls often die of starvation, and the signs of spiritual starvation are very clear if you bother looking for them. For example, weakness towards temptation. Why am I always you know, giving in to temptation? Why do I find it so difficult to overcome certain temptation? You know, do I have to work on the temptation? No, no, if you're having trouble overcoming temptation, it's because you're spiritually weak. And why are you spiritually weak? You're not spending enough time in the spiritual gym, that's why. Or lack of interest in spiritual things. There's a, you know, there's a symptom of spiritual weakness. I'm not interested in godly things in religious things. I have no interest in those things. When I hear that, I'm listening to a person. It's like someone says, uh, uh, sometimes my heart beats really, really fast and then sometimes my heart beats really, really slow. I would say to this person, you need to come with me. We need to kind of attach the things to you and you know, you've got heart issues. Well, the person who says, you know, I'm just not into church. I'm not into all that spiritual stuff. You know, I'm saying, oh, you need to come with me. You, you're, in, you're in trouble. You're sick. Or someone that has no desire to be with God in prayer. You know, a person, you know, examine yourself. If you have never had any desire to be with God in prayer, to be, to be quiet and just to be left alone so that you can be with God in prayer, 
that's a symptom of spiritual weakness. I'm not condemning you. I'm not, you know, this is not a hell, fire, and brimstone sermon. I'm just telling you, just like I would tell you if I was a medical doctor, here are the symptoms of the flu, or here are the symptoms of thyroid cancer, or here, you know, well, here are the symptoms of a weak spiritual person. Weak towards, can't overcome stuff. Same bad habits 20 years in. Lack of interest in spiritual things. No desire to be with God in prayer and little or no service in the name of Jesus Christ. Coming to church and reading your Bible and serving others in prayer and praise and evangelism, all these things are necessary to keep your soul alive. To ignore the things of God is to dishonor God Himself. The second way to dishonor Him is blasphemy. Exodus chapter 20, verse seven. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes His name in vain. You know, I was working with some people a while back, it's happened several times, the same experience, and they're not members of the church, you know, for some reason or other, I happen to be uh, you know, with them, and you'll hear somebody say, wow, well, JC, you know, using the Lord's name in vain, or GD this, or you know, so on and so forth, and then they'll realize either I'm a Christian or I'm a minister, and they go, oh, oh, excuse me. <laughs> and I usually tell them, I said, uh, hey, don't excuse, he said, that's your language, not mine. And you've not offended me I'm not the one who's just been offended by your language. Don't ask for my forgiveness. That, that usually stops that pretty <laughs> quickly. Pretty quickly. Ignoring spiritual exercise you know, is a passive way of losing your soul. Blasphemy is the proactive way of losing your soul. Using God's name without respect or ridiculing Him or ridiculing his people or his things or his word. This is a in your face way of losing your soul. As a matter of fact, the last couple of years it's been rather chic. It's been, uh, uh, it's been popular to write books that are over the top in insulting those who believe in God. You know, the new atheists, the neo-atheists of today, I mean, they're, they're not stealth atheists. They write books, you know, God is this, or God is bad, or this is a joke, or you know, Christians uh, you know, are, are fools, and you know, they're just in your face with their, dis, with their disbelief. Today, it is considered improper for a child to hear a vulgar four-letter word for procreation. Movies that have the F word uh, will be rated R. As a matter of fact, the rule is if there's one F word, you know what I'm talking about, if there's only one throughout the movie, it'll get a PG-13, all things considered. But if you use the word twice, then it automatically gets an R rating. But if you use the name of Jesus Christ or God in a derogatory way, then the movie can still be PG or PG-13. So it's okay to blaspheme, go ahead, knock yourself out, but the F word, we don't want our children to hear the F word like they don't hear the F word. You know, what kind of a crazy world do we live in? The Bible explicitly says that God will punish those who do this, but some people actually believe because God doesn't strike them dead now, it means that they're getting away with their insults. Well, I've got something to tell you about that, my friends. God takes care of business in His own time, not in our time. You better be afraid. You better be afraid. And if you have the chance while you're still alive, you better ask for forgiveness, because he's going to take care of business with all those people who thought it was sport to use his name, or to use the name of his son in a disgusting and dishonorable way. A third way to dishonor God, Exodus chapter 20, verse four and five, is idol worship. Verse four and five. It says, you shall not make for yourselves an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. 
you shall not uh, worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the th of fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands, uh, to those who love me and keep my commandments. This has taken many forms throughout history, but basically it's the remaking of God into a form created by man. The ancients used the form of the sun and the stars or animals or mythic personalities and heroes and they fashioned gods out of those. We do it today by transforming God into a philosophy or into a family or into feelings or into nature or material wealth. Let's face it, the USA's God is money because money rules everything, right? Money is the bottom, bottom line, absolutely. Uh, there's like this little room you know, inside of us where God is supposed to reside at the center of our being. If He isn't there, then whatever is in His place, in other words, what makes us tick, what drives us, what we serve, that's our idol. For some it's money, for some it's fame, for some it's sex or power or sports or a car or being right all the time, whatever it is. Whatever's in that little room, whatever makes you tick, that isn't God, that, that's your particular idol. That idol may be the thing that moves us through life, but it will not save our souls in the end. And then finally, we dishonor God through disbelief. Exodus chapter 20, verses two and three. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. There's only one God and He has clearly revealed Himself through the creation, through our consciences, through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God says that there's no excuse for disbelief, no excuse. Romans chapter eight, verses 18 to 21, Paul lays out the case, they're without excuse. God has provided enough proof for anyone to believe that He is. In the end, the number one reason why people lose their souls is because they refuse to believe in God. They refuse to believe in Jesus Christ, whom God sent with signs and with wonders and with a resurrection. The number one reason why disciples lose their souls is because they stop believing what they once held as true. And why? Because they just stop working at it. That's why. All of these other ways to lose your soul, lying, stealing, so on and so forth, usually stem from a lack of faith in God in the first place and a lack of obedience to His Son, Jesus Christ. And so in asking His disciples, what will you give in exchange for your soul, Jesus reminded them that the power of free will, it works both ways. We can choose to believe and follow Christ into eternal life, or we can choose to throw it all away by falling victim to the soul killers that I've just mentioned. The choice, however, is clearly our own to make, and not once in a lifetime, but every single day. I don't know about you, but in my life, Every day I got to make some kind of decision that says, I'm still in the game, Lord, I'm still in the game. A temptation comes by you know, that says, you know, you know, the situation's working out in such a way that if you just cut this little corner or kind of forget this, this, this thing that you, a deal that you made with yourself, you know, not to do something, you know, just this one time. And I have to answer back to that voice, no, not today. That's not going to happen. That's not even going to happen. That image that you're trying to put in my mind, sorry, eject, it's not going to happen. Every day, for one reason or another, I've got to make that decision over again, every single day. And so today and each day, you have the power to say yes to God and yes to Christ and no to disbelief, and no to the soul-destroying things that go with it. Won't you come to Jesus Christ today? You can choose Christ today and demonstrate that you believe by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And you can choose to believe again if you've fallen by coming forward 
and receiving the prayers of our elders and the church in order to restore you into a right relationship with God. Whatever it is that you need, we're ready to minister to you now. Please come as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation.